The reason for that is that back in the days of the wisdom schools, the brotherhoods, and all of the organized activities that taught spiritual truth, they found it easier to teach by symbol than by outright plain language. And of course it has been proven over the centuries that wherever a deep subject is taught in plain language, ultimately the subject is lost, the meaning is lost, the demonstration of the meaning is lost. This has been particularly true of spiritual wisdom, of scripture, where for many centuries the Bible has been read as if every statement were literally true, as if every statement were a statement of uh, truth in the manner in which it is presented. For instance, uh, that Joshua made the sun to stand still. Now, behind that, there is undoubtedly a spiritual truth behind that statement. But the statement itself as it is written is not a truth. Nobody has ever made the sun to stand still. Nobody ever will make the sun to stand still. In the same way, there are passages of Scripture that have undoubtedly made you wonder whether or not they were true. For instance, did the Red Sea literally open for Moses to walk across? Did the master look up and have a few loaves and fishes literally multiply themselves so that a whole multitude could eat and twelve baskets full be left over? Is it literally true that the master was taken from the crucifix completely dead and entombed and on the third day rose and walked the earth. Many of these things must, many of these questions must have come to your mind. And the religious literature of the world shows that these questions have come to the minds of scholars so that we have a large literature on these subjects affirming and denying. As a matter of fact, only recently we have come across another very large literature trying to prove that Jesus Christ once lived and walked on this earth as if there were a very grave question about it and in searching you will find a large literature that actually denies that there was such an actual man walking this earth. So that when you stop to think, there must be many questions come to your mind, and if you are a student on the spiritual path, you will decide these things for yourself by your own inner conviction. In other words, the kingdom of God is within you. The answer to every question is within you. The solution to every problem on earth is within you. And you can bring them forth in the degree that you are willing to devote yourself 
dedicate yourself to that task. Now, <clears throat> one of the questions that must come to the thought of a thinker is if God can heal the sick and if God can heal the sick through prayer why is it that so little healing is done through prayer in this world now there isn't anyone in this room who doesn't know that very little healing is accomplished in the world through prayer there isn't anyone in this room who doesn't know how many tens of millions of parents have prayed and are praying for the health of their children and then finding that either they must find the right form of materia medica or let the child be sick and die or find one of the few metaphysical or spiritual healers capable of bringing out healing. Now, in the entire world, with its more than four billion people, there are only a handful of metaphysical and spiritual healers. And uh, therefore, even allowing that all of them do some healing work, that is very, very little healing. When you stop to think of the fact that Scripture reveals that God does heal the sick through prayer. Now, we have millions of churches on earth, and uh, most of these believe in the power of prayer and yet very few of them ever accomplish anything in the way of healing through prayer so the answer the question must come to you why why is this well if you follow it far enough you'll come to your own conclusion but I'll tell you mine If you pray and your prayers are not answered, I think it's very safe to accept that you are praying amiss. And that's my answer to that question. Why has so little healing work done through the power of prayer? And my conviction is that the manner of praying is all wrong. It is needless to repeat that out of the 100,000 who go to Lourdes each year, only 15 people get healed. It is needless to repeat how many millions of parents and how many hundreds of thousands of ministers Priests, rabbis are continually praying for the health of their congregations and how little result they achieve in the way of healing. And so the subject of healing through prayer resolves itself into this. Either we must give up the idea that healing through prayer is possible as a general thing or we must accept that there is a way of praying that we do not yet know sufficient about and for me the second explanation is the correct one I know from experience that spiritual healing is not only a present possibility but I also know that it's more to be relied on 
than any other form of healing yet conceived by man. Then the next step must be how how are we to pray to bring this healing into our experience and when we speak of healing let us understand that what we mean is how do we dissolve the problems of human existence whether they are physical diseases mental diseases whether they are financial lacks whether they are errors of human relationships at any level marital filial community capital and labor international whatever problem of human existence arises it can be met by prayer when the master said that he came to heal the sick to raise the dead to open the eyes of the blind to open the ears of the deaf to preach the gospel and uh, as you know he overcame the results of storms and accidents lack he virtually embraced all of the problems of human experience and so it must be that we too must accept the fact that when we speak of healing we are really speaking of the healing of any human problem in any form any degree now <clears throat> probably between now and Monday night I will be able to discourage some of you from taking that class or on the other hand it may be possible that some who have no idea of taking it may be induced to take it depending whether or not you have success uh, with this little experiment in meanness let us take the passage my kingdom is not of this world now you recognize that these are the words of the master my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom must mean the kingdom of the son of God the spiritual kingdom the kingdom of God that is within you this kingdom is not of this world now at first it might seem then that he is saying that this kingdom of God has nothing to do with your diseases or your lack or your sins but of course we only have to examine the master's ministry to know that that would be a false interpretation in other words if we take his statement literally that the kingdom of God has nothing to do with this world we would then believe that the kingdom of God has nothing to do with our diseases or our sins our poverty our erroneous human relationships but he did not mean to convey that meaning as you can prove whatever the name or nature of the problem that is disturbing you most whether it is one of your ill health or the ill health of a member of your family or whether it is a problem of supply or lack of supply or a problem of human relationships will you between now and Monday night 
agree within yourself that every time this problem comes to your thought that you will answer unto it my kingdom is not of this world and then refuse to treat that problem or that condition or to take it to God or try to bring God to it in other words every time the problem intrudes itself into your thought and be assured of this that between now and Monday night it's going to do that much more than it ever has in the past that is the nature of this work that we're doing that the very moment you try to ignore a thing it hits you right over the head and tries to make you aware of it and so you may be assured that your problem whatever it is is really going to lift up its head between now and Monday night if if you follow this routine you are not going to take this problem to God and uh, you are not going to bring God to this problem you are going to take the attitude my kingdom the spiritual kingdom the Christ kingdom is not of this world and therefore I am not going to take the problems of this world into heaven or nor am I going to bring the kingdom of heaven down to this problem but I am going to let the tares and the wheat grow side by side and that will be your second passage to address to your problems let the tares and the wheat grow side by side be sure that you make no attempt to heal yourself make no attempt <clears throat> to rise above this erroneous condition make no attempt at all to meet it but on the contrary refuse to take it into consideration because my kingdom the spiritual kingdom has nothing to do with that problem and that problem can never find entrance into the kingdom of God and I will let the tears and the wheat grow side by side and see what happens now <clears throat> this will not be an easy assignment and I'm sure there will be times when you will wish I hadn't brought it up and have let sleeping dogs lie but if you are faithful I am sure that many of you will witness something you never dreamed of before and that is the fact that God is really too pure to behold iniquity and that there's no use ever of praying God to do something to your problems because God won't God doesn't God doesn't know anything of your problems and uh, if God ever solved the problem of any one individual that would be a horrible God to have loose in the world because he'd be awfully mean to all the other people who at the same time had problems but whom he ignored that is one of the sins you know of this belief that God can be influenced to heal my ills while leaving you sick that was the sin that I brought called attention to when uh, everyone uh, began to thank God for ending the European war while the Asiatic war was still on as if God really and truly could end a half a war and let the other half rage or as if God really could heal disease for 
a dozen of us in this room and then leave all the rest of us in our sins and diseases. It makes for something of a horrible God to picture such. And so it is that you will discover that healing does not rest with God, it rests with us and our understanding of God and of the nature of prayer. And that you can see best not by an explanation, but by a demonstration. For instance, the Master says, resist not evil, and yet every attempt that we make to bring harmony into our lives is a resistance to evil. It is a trying to get rid of it, to overcome it, to destroy it. It is a resistance to it that makes us want to get rid of it. <coughs> and yet, we are told, resist not evil. There are other places in the scriptures of the world, in the Hebrew scriptures and the Chinese scriptures, where the same principle is brought to light that if you do not resist the devil he will flee from you that when you resist him you make the battle more real you make the struggle more real now one way you can have of seeing to what degree you can prove this by just leaving your problem alone for these next few days and working in accord with this principle. Uh, I might remind you of the story of a friend of mine who was a very well-known and very successful uh, Christian science practitioner. And uh, Every week, he left his office Friday noon to go to one of his two ranches and came back Monday morning. And he had no telephone at either one of his ranches. And one day, I said to him, I don't quite understand how you can do this with a large practice like you have and uh, not to have your patients in touch with you over the weekend, every week. And he looked at me, and he said, a funny thing I've noticed, none of my patients dies while I'm away over the weekend. They wait for me to come home on Monday. <laughs> in other words, it doesn't pay to worry about them, and it does pay to leave them in the care of God and not in the care of man. So it is, when we resist not evil, when we agree that we will let the tares and the wheat grow together, if it seems frightening at first, please remember that you are trusting yourself to God so that should there be any difficulty about the situation, you are really trusting God to take hold of it while you are absent at your particular ranch. Always remember that if you make your bed in hell, God will be there, and if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God will be there, so that you really need not fear to let these tares and the wheat grow together. And so it will be that with every temptation, let us use that word, temptation, at every temptation to treat, at every temptation to pray, at every temptation to meditate for a problem Resist the temptation. Turn from it and figuratively go out to your ranch. 
Only you can make it a movie if you like, or the television, or a book, or anything that will prevent you from sitting down to pray about this particular problem. And remember always, my kingdom is not of this world, and therefore I am not going to try to mix the kingdom of God with the temporal universe. When you succeed, even in a small measure, in proving this principle, you will know that the temporal kingdom isn't something to be overcome or destroyed by God. It is something to be realized as a mirage by man. God already knows God's kingdom. God already knows reality. God already knows immortality, eternality, and infinity. And so, the only thing that God knows nothing of, thank God, is temporality finiteness, mortality. Therefore, it lies with us to know the truth that will make us free. <clears throat> Don't think that this leaves God out of your picture. On the contrary, this is the only way in which you can honor God because you are saying, whether or not you say it, that the kingdom of God is intact and that nothing can enter the kingdom of God that defileth or maketh a lie and that anything unlike God was not made. And it puts it in the realm of that mythical kingdom, that Adam dream, that temporality, mortality, now remember, we were not taught by the Master or by Paul to bring God into mortality, but we were told that we must put off mortality. We were told that we must die daily. We were never told by the Master to go to God and ask Him to heal our diseases. On the contrary, when he healed, he said, Do you believe that I can do this? Or, What did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. Or, Open your eyes. Or, Maiden, I say unto thee, arise. Or, Lazarus, come forth. In no case was there an appeal to God to heal anybody. It was an honoring God in the sense of, God, I know that your kingdom is intact. I know this maiden is not dead but sleepeth, or this Lazarus is not dead but sleepeth. I know that harmony prevails, and so it is that we are taught, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so it is, instead of trying to lift your problem up to God and get it into the mind of God so that he may do something about it, or instead of trying to bring the kingdom of God down into your mythical problem, recognize the fact instantly God's kingdom is not of this ephemeral world. God's kingdom is not in this belief in two powers. I must know the truth and the truth will make me free. And the truth that I know is that all that God made is good. And God made all that was made. Therefore, this that I would fight, battle, overcome, destroy, not being of God was not made. And then we have authority for saying 
that these problems exist only in the same way that the mirage exists on the desert as a misperception of what actually is. Yes, we are told that when we awaken we will see him as he is. We are not told that when we awaken we will heal anybody, but we will see him as he is, and that is perfect. And that is perfect now. So then, the way to prove this and the way to pray in such a way as to honor God is to know thy kingdom is come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom is established on earth, not will be in the future tense. <coughs> that, that, of course, must be to any thinking purpose person a ridiculous statement that God's kingdom will be established. God wouldn't be God if he had a kingdom and kept it away from this earth now and was going to restore it later. God couldn't be God to know any harmony in the future tense. The only way God could be God would be to establish his kingdom where he is and when he is and if you hearken well you will also learn that in the kingdom of God there is neither time nor space that is what makes instantaneous healing possible that's what makes instantaneous reformation possible that is what makes instantaneous forgiveness possible there is no such thing thing as waiting in hell until your sins have been uh, washed out. There is no such thing as waiting in the alcove until you've become pure. There is no such thing as waiting somewhere for something to happen, for that would take away from the instantaneity of God. That would take away from the omnipresence and omnipotence and omniscience of God anything that would have to do with a future tense would well at least it would degrade our sense of God for God cannot be God except now and this now must be eternal and this now must be infinite this now must be omnipresence of God and nothing less and nothing else and you only honor God in your realization of timeless God. Timeless God, ageless God. And you find authority in the scripture in such passages as God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I will never leave you. I will be with you unto the end of the world. None of that indicates that there is any future tense in our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is now. Now are ye the sons of God. And if you cannot accept that, there is no way to accept the Christian teaching. Now are we the sons of God. Know ye not that ye are the sons of God, that your bodies are the very temple of God, and all of this now, not in a future tense. That is the only reason the Master could forgive the woman taken in adultery or the thief on the cross and any other of the sinners. Judas Iscariot had to be forgiven now, not after he did penance, not after he waited a period to be absolved. Now do I not condemn you. Right now do I forgive you. And 70 times 7 do I forgive you now. Because we are living in the nowness of your divine sonship. Therefore, do not go to God for anything 
for that would be indicating that you want it in a future tense. Or even if you expected it now, you are declaring that it wasn't there a moment ago. And so you are taking away from the instantaneity, from the omnipresence of God. Instead of going to God, remember that God's kingdom is intact, now are we the sons of God and God's kingdom is not of this world and then refuse to take this world to God refuse to take the pains of the flesh refuse to take the lacks of the pocketbook refuse to take the inharmonies of human relationships to God but stand fast and in doing it this way you don't have to wait to sit down and close your eyes. In doing it this way, you don't have to wait for a time of prayer. You can agree with Paul. Pray without ceasing. So if you happen to be busy with cooking or housekeeping, or if the businessman is out about his business, he doesn't have to stop for one second, not even to close his eyes or to say a prayer, he can do what he's doing and still think God's kingdom is not of this world and I'm not taking this world into God's kingdom. Therefore, let the tares and the wheat grow together. And this can be done 20 times a day, 30 times a day, 40 times a day. No time element enters into this and uh, no waiting. And so we won't make the mistake the next time if we do hear the bells ring that tells us that the summit conference has been successful and peace is on earth we won't wait next time until next Sunday to thank God as we did last time we will thank God where we are right there where we are in the tub or in the shower or in the bus, or in the business, wherever we may be, and bring instantaneity into our experience so that our lives become a dedication to gratitude. For gratitude is that form of love which best expresses the qualities of love. And only as we live in this sense of gratitude, and what have we to be grateful for, if not the fact that God is and that God is now and that God is where I am and that where I am God is and that all of this exists in this glorious minute when now are we the sons of God and as we let <coughs> gratitude flow out from us for this joyous experience for this realization we then find how it is that love is a healer that love is the way of life that love is the source of all life and that this love love best manifests it through itself through our gratitude and our gratitude mustn't be because someone gave us something our gratitude mustn't be because of some external condition. Our gratitude must be that there is an infinite, invisible, spiritual kingdom which is intact. And you see, once you separate this world from that kingdom, then this world starves and destroys itself. It becomes a nothingness because of its own nature. <clears throat> Watch. Watch this carefully. There must come a time in your experience when you do away with the future tense 
when you do away with thinking about good that is to come or good that is desired or harmony that is hoped for all of this putting things into the future is a human thing and not divine and it does not have the sanction of spirit there is no way to reach spiritual harmony by expecting good there is no way of reaping spiritual harmony by expecting harmony there is no way of reaping of experiencing spiritual harmony in any other way than in understanding that whatever the appearances may be harmony is now is the time now is the time of salvation now is when we are children of God now is when we are part of the spiritual kingdom now is when uh, the kingdom of God is established on earth whether or not we are yet awakened to it is not the point or whether or not we have only overcome 70 percent of our discords and are still working with the other 30 <clears throat> this really means nothing the only thing that counts is that we have a principle and that we work with this principle until we demonstrate it in its fullness surely we are not all going to demonstrate a pair of wings and a heart between now and Monday night but it will be a wonderful thing if we have seen enough of this principle even in some minor way or seemingly insignificant way so that at least we know we have found a principle and then have the coming months in which to work out this principle but always from the standpoint of now always from the standpoint of the word is as you go back to our textbook the infinite way you will find that there are two little words that comprise the foundation of our work the word as and the word is those were the two original words given to me God is manifest as his son God the father is God the son and uh, God then is manifest as individual you and me God is not something separate and apart from you and me God is not something to be attained God is to be realized God is to be understood now I and my father are one not after a period of life and death but right now God has made no provision in his kingdom for a future tense now are we the sons of God and it is now that we must realize I and my father are one son thou art ever with me we can emphasize that word ever or we could emphasize every word son thou art ever with me oh he's calling us son son thou art ever with me son thou art ever with me son thou art ever with me oh we can take that entire passage and work with it until it rings in our ears that we can never be separate or apart from God we are inseparable and indivisible son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine and the master I and the father are one thou seest me thou seest him that sent me for I and the father are one and as we dwell in this word as it naturally comes to the word is God is my being God is the life of man 
God is the mind of man. God is the soul of man. God is the spirit of man. We're told in Scripture, God is the health of thy countenance. We're also told God is thy supply, and God is thy fortress, and God is thy high tower. The whole Bible is made up of is. It is all is, and there is no future tense. And I know from experience how many of us and how often we cheat ourselves of the harmony that is waiting to flow into experience because we cannot accept it as an is. Yes, I think we're ready to accept it if it'll only come a minute from now. But it won't, and that one minute of expectation separates us from it. Because in the kingdom of God, there is nothing to be adjusted a minute from now. You might just as well expect God to adjust the tides a minute from now, or make two times two four a minute from now, or to make apples come from apple trees a minute from now. All of that is a state of is, a state of divine being now. And whatever isn't true in the divine being now is never going to be true in the future. H2O is water now, always has been, always will be. All these laws of automotive engineering, of airplane travel, all these laws of television, radio, they've always existed in the world. They do not exist in the future. They have always existed as they exist now. They were only awaiting recognition. And when they were recognized, they were right there operating now. So it is with the law of God in your life and in mine. The law of God of life, the law of life, which of course must be the law of health, the law of immortality, is operating in our experience now, and there is no use praying for it. Praying for it will separate you from it, at least in belief, because you can't separate yourself from that which is, but you can separate yourself from it in experience. And the way to do it is to pray to God to do something for you and see how far you separate yourself from what you are praying for. Whereas, when you understand now, God is the light of my being. God is the lamp unto my feet. God is the health of my countenance. God is my fortress, my hiding place, my high tower. God is the life of my being. God is, Son, thou art ever with me, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine, and just keep the problem in its rightful place out of your mind, and let those tares and the wheat grow together until one of these mornings you awaken, and someone by noon or afternoon will remind you that there are no tares around you, you are all wheat. We don't know ourselves when our problems leave us until someone calls our attention to it. Think of God as now. <coughs> Think of the love of God as now. Think of the love of God as being with you now. It makes no difference if right now you appear to be in some hell, it makes no difference if you appear to be going through the valley of the shadow of death. Make yourself realize that the love of God can have no future tense or it would not be God in action, for God is omnipresence. And where the presence of God is, there is liberty. And the presence of God is wherever the presence of God is realized. Well, don't get mad at me. Thank you. <laughs>